Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session of the Wikisite conference. This session is going to be looking particularly at the research output items that populate it. Um, before we get started, I want to quickly acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm situated on today. Um, and I'd encourage you all to think about whose land you're currently situated on. So I would like to pay my respect to elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. First up in our session is Daniel Meachin, who's going to be talking about collaborative curation via Wikidata, uh, the case of citations and source metadata. So I shall add him to the stream now. Uh, I'm sharing my screen now. Can you see that? There we go. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah, I started an Etherpad that I think I sent you the link. Um, and uh, I've actually remodeled my talk for this session entirely after the experience from today. So um, my initial thought was uh, essentially to give much uh, of the talk that I was giving this morning, because when I was signing up for this session, I didn't know I would be giving the other talk. And uh, then also, uh, I have a version four of this state of wiki site thing that actually zooms in on the um, research outputs a bit more. Uh, but from the sessions that I attended uh, today, and also from the reactions I saw on on Twitter, I actually thought it's it's better if we have something more interactive than yet another monologue from me. So um, I cobbled together a number of notes that I threw into this etherpad. And uh, I encourage people to actually uh, follow the, the same approach that we did uh, for my morning today, <laughs> um, which was that um, we collect questions and comments in the etherpad, and then the discussion flows from there. I put in an, uh, a set of notes uh, to get things started. So for instance, uh, there was a tweet that kind of struck me, which uh, said, we are on the verge of moving from the age of information to the age of verification. Um, some version of that could well be like a Wikisite motto. And since it was tagged Wikisite, I guess they found it or heard it on some Wikisite stream. Um, and I think that's, that's good to have as a mindset. Now, uh, we are in this research output uh, session. Um, and then maybe we can re-read that um, line. Or maybe I should make it a little bit larger. Um, so what does the age of information mean for research output? What does the age of information, uh, no, the age of verification mean for research output? And here, uh, some of the first thoughts are the age of information for research output means, well, it's not all just on paper. It's not all just PDFs. There was a uh, conference called Beyond the PDF almost 10 years ago. And uh, while well, scholarly publishing hasn't moved much from, from that, um, although there are lots of experiments um, in various corners of the research ecosystem. In the age of verification, uh, well, at least, um, there is progress in terms of the need of verification because there are so many claims out there, um, but we don't really make it uh, simple to uh, verify things. So a personal experience, I uh, was attending a hackathon about uh, almost three years ago now, uh, where we tried to reproduce um, the um, computational parts of some research uh, papers that have been shared on PubMed Central. And uh, so they, these papers, they contained Jupyter notebooks, uh, which are some sort of a notebook a format that inc can include text and code. And uh, most of those notebooks, uh, which were included into the papers in order to facilitate sharing and reproducibility, most of them were not computationally uh, reproducible, um, which means that some dependency in terms of software or data was just not provided. and uh, then uh, someone who uh, does not really know uh, this kind of 
software well had would have trouble uh, reproducing the kind of claims that were derived from that software. Uh, so the tweet that had this this quote, and I'm happy to discuss that. I have a set of about six topics that I um, I'm kind of in the mood to discuss from the framework of what does that mean for Wikisite? What does it mean for research outputs and maybe the interaction? So some of the things that I noticed, uh, diversity. Uh, in the Wikisite steering committee, we've really tried to put a lot of emphasis on the diversity of the projects that we support. Uh, and um, we are still, we still have long ways to go, but I, I think there is progress visible, for instance, in the diversity of the projects that were recently approved as small grants and e-fellowships. But when I looked at the uh, presenters at the Wikisite 2020 that I saw today, I haven't seen a single woman. Um, so that certainly is uh, an indicator of problems with diversity. Um, and uh, there may well have been some, and maybe I was just in the wrong sessions. Uh, um, but yeah, that was just uh, what I noticed. Uh, also, the session formats. Um, when we had the our traditional Wikisite events, they were kind of they had a three-day format. The first one was similar to what we have today, mostly a conference kind of style, mostly monologues followed by short Q and A sessions. The second day was really interactive in terms of like more breakout sessions where people would sit together and do stuff, move things forward in a particular direction. And the third uh, part was essentially a hackathon to work on uh, ideas that came up during the first two days. And I'm missing some of those interactive parts and I'm wondering how a virtual conference format like this can facilitate those kinds of discussions. Um, then we have the more general problem of uh, the diversity of Wikisite contributors, which kind of mirrors uh, the diversity or the lack thereof in the Wikimedia movement or in the uh, tech space. Um, but interestingly, it does not uh, mirror the diversity problems that the library community has. Um, and so um, because there the, the situation is just different. And uh, so there is an, potentially there is a chance to, to learn from each other. Uh, I also notice the diversity in terms of the languages covered by Wikisite. Um, so I note that this uh, conference has uh, a multitude of the languages that the previous conferences had. Um, that's good. Um, and I um, just encourage people to move forward in this direction and also uh, the diversity of the topics covered by Wikisite. Uh, I haven't seen much in terms of humanities uh, on the program yet. Um, there may well be some things, um, but uh, we have lots of technical aspects, which is good. We have lots of, let's say, library kind of things. And I was just in a session where we had uh, political uh, science, essentially. Um, but still, there there is no ancient history or archaeology or anything like that. Uh, and I would encourage people to think, uh, how can we connect the Wikisite community and the research communities that are active in these uh, fields together so that Wikisite can help emphasize the research that happens in those fields and uh, also help them. And that uh, the, the content in uh, the Wikisite ecosystem can benefit from the expertise of people in those fields. So that's another kind of uh, topic that I'm interested in, in discussing here. Then research outputs in general. So um, I already mentioned those Jupyter notebooks in a different context, in the context of reproducibility. But uh, I also looked at them in the context of how they are used across the Wikimedia ecosystem. And so there is a talk here that I gave specifically on this subject. And uh, then uh, they are also research artifacts. And uh, they are increasingly being used in order to support certain statements and research, and sometimes also in the Wikimedia ecosystem. And so uh, the question is, uh, what can Wikisite do to um, better cover research artifacts like this? And that is just an example. I could, could have chosen some poems. It's just that more recently, I've looked more into Jupyter notebooks than into poems. But the problem uh, that we don't have good data models uh, from a Wikisite perspective for poems is, is the same as for Jupyter Notebooks as it is for many other things. So uh, just today, court cases, for instance, came up. 
and legal documents and, and lots of those things. Uh, another thought that I have here is in another of my volunteer roles, I'm an editor that actually promotes the sharing of research materials all across the research cycle. So that is from ideas to grant proposals, whether they're funded or not, to data management plans, posters, policy briefs, and so on. And uh, it also does the usual research and review articles. Um, but very few of those intermediate or early research outcomes make their way into uh, the wiki ecosystem uh, or, let's say, the interwebs more widely. Uh, some of it is called uh, great literature, but much of it is not shared by default. And then the question is, to what extent can Wikisite help this transformation, which actually links us back to this uh, age of information, age of verification kind of thought. Uh, to what extent can Wikisite contribute to making it more easy to discover those things, those early phases of a research project or, uh, or uh, possibilities for people who want to engage with research, for instance, as citizen scientists or as a scientist working in a different field or something, or even as a specialist working on the same topic. Uh, right now, since most research is not open, it's hard, but for the open parts of the research ecosystem, maybe Wikisite can play a role to facilitate discovery and um, collaboration amongst those people who want to work in the open. Another line of thought is uh, we're in this COVID pandemic for quite a while now, and in a way, uh, at least for me, um, another epidemic, the Zika one, was very crucial uh, in terms of getting started with Wikisite. Um, so I built this Zika corpus uh, initially just to better understand how a corpus would work in Wikimedia contexts. And suddenly it became relevant because there was an epidemic. I initially chose the Zika corpus because it was a small corpus, because there were less than 100 papers when I started. But then within a few months, it was more than a thousand. And uh, so that wasn't entirely planned. But it helped me and it helped uh, others in the Wikisite ecosystem to um, strengthen our workflows and to explore gaps, to explore possibilities, to collaborate, things like that. And then on that basis, I think uh, the Wiki project COVID-19 was off to a better start than it would have been without this precursor of the Zika epidemic. Uh, and on that basis, I'm wondering uh, what is the contribution that Wikisite can make in order for either the, the Wikisite or the Wikimedia community or society as a whole, or uh, specifically the research community, to be better prepared for ongoing and future disasters, and especially their information needs. So we know that in uh, the case of an epidemic, certain questions will be asked about the uh, pathogen and about the ways it is being transmitted and then the effects on the humans and on their environment and things like that. Um, some of those things can be predicted. Some others um, are more or less specific to the pathogen. So for instance, for Ebola, it uh, turned out to be very important uh, that we know uh, and learn more about burial practices um, for uh, this epidemic here. The face masks and social distancing uh, are a bit more important than for previous um, outbreaks. And uh, so w the question is to what extent can we prepare for the known knowns and the known unknowns? And uh, different disaster types, they come with different information needs. For uh, an earthquake, it's different than for an epidemic, than for a drought or a flood or a hurricane or these kind of things. But all of these uh, disasters are covered by Wikimedia projects, and I actually gave a talk about this recently as well. And there are also specific re referencing and verification problems uh, that are um, like typical of disasters. In the early phases of a disaster, you know very little about it. You just know something unusual happened, and it's potentially dangerous or obviously dangerous, uh, or at least to some, some people, some groups. Uh, but you don't know details, and some of the details that you initially hear, they are not entirely true because uh, some of the estimates were wrong or some of the uh, news uh, just, they, they went through strange channels uh, because there are no established channels or the established channels are actually affected by the disaster. Um, and the question then is, um, how can we leverage uh, the fact that Wikimedia ecosystem is a global platform 
um, and well linked into the research ecosystem, which includes research into disaster mitigation and, and things like that. Um, how can we leverage that in order to support information needs um, during the early phases of a disaster? Another thing I would like to stimulate some uh, Scolia as a role model for exposing or exploring or learning or teaching linked open data. So um, basically, uh, I, I put in the link here. If you don't know uh, what Scolia is, it is a, a front end to Wikidata that uh, basically makes use of the fact that Wikidata contains linked open data. And so if we have a chain of uh, entries in Wikidata, let's say A, B, C, D, that are linked somehow, um, then um, Scolia can bring them together. And knowing that A uh, links to B and B links to C and C links to D, you can then uh, plot A and D together on, on, a, on a page very easily. Um, and uh, you can rearrange uh, the, the ways in which you show that data uh, much more easily than if you think in terms of tables where all the links uh, are separate and uh, you, you cannot um, easily combine the content from different tables. Um, and so Scolia has already served as a model for a similar tool that uh, exposes um, language information, information about languages, uh, like scenes stored in Wikidata. But in principle, the idea that we kind of pre-compile certain questions uh, for a, diff a specific kind of information and uh, we convert those questions into Sparkle queries, and then we wrap um, a web application around those Sparkle queries. That's the, the basic idea of Scolia and Audio. Uh, that is transferable to many different domains. It doesn't. Uh, there's no need to limit this to um, the realm of scholarly publications or of um, lexemes. And uh, so, I would just like to, yeah. Um, let that thought travel a little bit. The final thing is, um, about two years ago, we put a lot of effort into writing this Wikisite roadmap. Um, and um, it basically outlines four options of how Wikisite could, could or should move forward in the future. And uh, yeah, we haven't really made much use of it. And we haven't really made the decisions that are somehow uh, required to be made. And then the question is, um, what can we do about this? Can we leverage some social science research or so in order to um, help the community make those decisions? Um, so these are just some thoughts. And now I would, I see there are 12 people in the Etherpad. I would like uh, you to, to come in and uh, state your opinions on those matters or uh, I can dig deeper into any of those points. Um, I just think it's it's nicer to have those discussions than just um, another monologue from my end. That's why I'll pause here and listen to whatever somebody has to say or um, read whatever is being written in the Etherpad. And if there is silence, and I hope that the moderators, they can bring in whatever feedback there is from the other channels, because right now I'm just seeing the etherpad here. Well, whilst people get um, uh, get a moment to write to the etherpad, um, I did want to ask a question of you, Daniel, which is, um, what do you think are the next steps for tools like Scolia? Do you think that it is important to have um, more small tools like Scolia or um, to focus attention on creating one highly multipurposed uh, tool? Um, I like the Unix Linux approach of having small, t lots of small tools that do one thing well. Um, Scolia is not of that kind. It's not that small anymore, and also it does lots of different things. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, this this doesn't fit too well together. On the other hand, um, I think Scolia has reached a um, level, a certain level of maturity. Uh, so we are actually in, engaged in a uh, project where we try to robustify the code. Uh, initially, when we started Scolia. It wasn't used very much. 
and uh, also there was not much data to show. Um, and now, uh, for certain things, there is much more data, which causes problems. Uh, whereas uh, in other cases, we still don't have much data, which also causes problems. And so, Scolia works best at a sweet spot where we have enough, not too much that we run into timeout problems or performance problems in general. Um, and so, optimizing tools like Scolia, and I, I guess the same would apply to Ordia and similar tools uh, um, in, in certain timeframes. Optimizing those tools for the sweet spot where they work best um, is a priority. And in a way, the, it is, it's really a pity that um, the tools like Scolia that are built around the Wikidata Query Service, they uh, kind of break down once there is too much information. Because that means uh, there's a lot of curation effort that has gone on in, in these contexts. And, and so and that would actually be the best basis for harvesting that and using it. But uh, due to the limits in how uh, the tool is constructed, uh, if there is too much information, it breaks down. And so working on that is one of our priorities. Um, and I'm happy to talk about this. But much of the, that is very technical. Uh, so right now, I think that most of what what's useful for many people is the kind of inspiration. Think about what this kind of pre-composed um, way of querying Wikidata can do in your area of research or other activities. We could do this for baseball championships if we wanted to. But here we're in the research session. And so think about research outputs, maybe posters. Uh, we could essentially have a, a poster session uh, composed entirely on uh, or rendered via Scolia. Um, that's possible. OK, I see a question here. Uh, someone wonders what the relations are between research ideas and outcomes and Wikisite. Um, right now, there, the main uh, relation is that I'm involved in both. Um, but uh, we're looking into more interactions. So for instance, the journal is mapping its, all its publications to the Sustainable Development Goals already since it started in 2015. <clears throat> and uh, Wikidata has been um, improving its coverage of the sustainable uh, development goals. And since many of those SDGs uh, of those goals can be linked to particular topics and we're increasing improving the topic mapping, this general idea of tagging the research as to which sustainable development goals uh, it is relevant to, that is something that is transferable from the, uh, the journal to uh, Wikisite in general. And I would love to work on that. Um, also, uh, uh, it would be nice to use some of the things, the unusual things that are published in the journal, like the data management plans or so, to um, test the workflows, the Wikisite workflows um, that um, would be used in order to describe such data management plans. Thanks, Daniel. Um, there's uh, another question. Um, with organization and government publications um, are not hosted in a stable way, and they're often just published online. Uh, how does the, verif the verifiability issue work if we have lots of broken links? And do you have any thoughts on how to? Oh, yeah, I have thoughts on that. And um, the they are especially crucial, actually, in crisis contexts, because uh, especially in crisis contexts, there are no established uh, channels. And many of the channels that are being established, they uh, change their links frequently, like on a matter of days or weeks. Um, and so, yes, it's very important to think about uh, some archiving. And that's the kind of thing that I uh, had in mind when I was thinking about how can we prepare for a future disaster context. We know that links break more often in disaster context than they do uh, in normal context. And they already break a lot in normal context. And yes, the Internet Archive is doing a tremendous amount of work and a good quality work in terms of archiving not just English Wikipedia, as mentioned here, but uh, across a number of Wikipedias, and to some extent also Wikidata, uh, the links that are used on, on our Wikimedia platforms. Um, and they are also archiving lots of other parts of the web. And that's good, but um, we haven't really figured out uh, mechanisms to leverage this systematically um, for, uh, for Wikisite. Uh, so uh, Wikisite does not currently 
systematically linked to um, Internet Archive copies of the publications it might have or something like this. Um, and but yeah, the, things are improving and um, it I, I certainly would encourage more activities in this space. And we're also there, we're in contact with the Internet Archive uh, uh, in various ways. Um, no, I'm reading line 52. I know that you have an association with a PLOS journal that publishes Wikipedia style articles that can be copied over to Wikipedia. How do you set that up? Did you contact them or did they contact you? Ah, well, that's it came out of a, uh, a conference, the OASPA conference, I think in 2012. Um, and um, there we were just in contact and we were having uh, the kind of conversations you have over lunch or over dinner at a conference and that, there that idea is sparked. Um, and um, so th that's how it came to be. And now uh, this has been in effect for yeah eight years. We've published on the order of 10 uh, papers this way, which is not a lot over ten, uh, eight years. So there's not a lot of interest. Um, and the combination of the wiki and the journal publication workflows is still not easy. Uh, Thomas, who is doing this in it for a different post journal, can also attest to that. Um, it was an experiment. I think it was a useful experiment. Um, but um, it's certainly not the prototype for communication in the future. So um, yeah, I hope this answers uh, to some extent. OK. Um, number 54, I keep getting recommended to use SourceMD, but then yeah, the new version doesn't work and documentation is well. OK, no, uh, no documentation. Yeah. Um, yeah, these are some of the problems. Uh, so SourceMD, uh, the original version, or one of the earlier versions still works and it has limited functionality, um, which also means uh, limited um, potential to destroy things or to, to make bad edits. Um, the newer source MD um, had lots of functionality, also in, included the functionality of an older tool called Orchidata. And that actually is problematic in, uh, in part because the data in Orchid is, is not very clean. And so if you just um, simply mass import data from ORCID without much thought uh, or additional curation, it can really mess up the workflows in the curation workflows on the Wikidata wiki site end. And since the, the modern uh, source MD combines these ORCID based workflows with the, uh, let's say, publication identifier based workflows, it has been blocked. Um, and yeah, that, that's a pity. Um, and, but it's open source. Anyone who understands PHP could go in and uh, modify that. Um, that doesn't include me very much. I don't know much PHP. Um, but I would love to have some of that functionality back. But I understand um, that some of the functionality it had uh, was problematic, especially the way it was used by some people. And uh, yeah, if some of the data sources that we're using, um, like Orchid, have bad data, then we need additional layers of verification to in order to filter for the good data that they also contain. Um, and uh, the, the tool itself cannot do that. And we need either additional technical layers or some social layers that you're just supposed to use SourceMD or whatever else in a certain way. And that requires documentation, as you point out, and documentation, as in much of the software uh, development world, is often neglected. Um, and so that's another way in which uh, someone could contribute to Wikisite, um, just going through the existing tools and improving the documentation. How do you do X? How do you disambiguate authors? Uh, or how do you visualize uh, certain things in Scolia? How do you uh, circumvent certain problems with uh, another tool or open refine or whatever? Documentation is very important. And whoever does documentation, I highly appreciate that. Um, that doesn't really answer your question, but uh, I guess it provides some background. One of the other aspects to that, I think, is that um, making sure that you're not limited just by PHP skills to be able to update and manage these sorts of tools. So I know that it's more common these days to be able to speak languages like Python or R. 
um, and there already is a Python package or Python library um, that allows you to read from and write to Wikidata. Um, and actually, Alex Lum and I have been updating the um, package in R to be able to also write to Wikidata. Um, so that'll allow us to also be able to um, build and patch some of the tools that have previously gone online because, for example, like SourceMD, um, that tool not only stopped working but is also no longer maintained by the, its original creator and it just happens to be that no one else in the community with the will to fix it happens to also have the technical language skills in PHP to fix it. But by broadening that technical base to things like um, R and Python, it kind of broadens who is able to, to contribute technically as well as uh, practically. Yeah, uh, so that solves uh, some of the technical aspects. It does not necessarily solve the social aspects or data quality aspects. Um, and uh, that is a, an ongoing conversation to have. So um, we have similar issues on, on comments, for instance, where uh, people were uploading images of low quality and that after a certain time the commons community has come up with um certain standards or mechanisms to um basically check those uploads and then to sort out the, the bad uh bad ones and uh on wiki side we have bits and pieces we have lots of um, mechanisms for quality control actually um but in certain corners they they just don't work at the scale where we need them Okay. Okay. So I don't see any further questions. All right. Thank you, Daniel. That was uh, that was excellent, and uh, we've seen you, um, Daniel. As uh, Leah mentioned, Daniel has been um, uh, uh, speaking and or presenting in a lot of the conferences today. I saw you know, I saw him popping up in uh, several of the streams last night. Uh, and uh, all of them are very, uh, very interesting. Um, so yeah, please go and watch the, the uh, videos on YouTube. All right, um, uh, we're gonna move on to our next speaker. So thank you, Daniel. Um, our next speaker is uh, Margaret Donald. Uh, Margaret is a statistician by trade, but uh, she's got a passion for botany. And uh, that passion for botany has led to, um, to a very um, extensive use of uh, the Wikisite platform to create and connect um, botanical literature um, authors and other metadata. Um, so Margaret's going to demonstrate her process um, to us today um, using a range of uh, Wikimedia tools. Oh, um, hang on. Um, sorry. Can you see that? Um, um Oh, I've lost everything. Um, let me go back. Escape. Um, Alex, can you see me? Um, I don't know whether you can see my presentation. I had did have it up and I was ready to start, but I can't. All right, hang on. I'll, um, I'll bring your, your slides up. Oh, good. Okay, I'll, I'll move on to it again. Thank you. Um, where are we, MD? Aha, fantastic. Okay, right. So as Alex said, I'm going to talk about populating Wikidata with some articles from a botanical journal, and I hope to get through this. <laughs> we'll see. All right. So uh, I've gone to the journal page here, and as usual, you can pick your volume and um, pick your set of articles. I've picked... Um, the volume from the year 2011, oops, the volume from 2011. And as you can see, there are three articles here that I want to upload. There's a whole pile more. Now, the trick to this is I'm simply going to grab the text from displaying three records, from below displaying three records, and I'm going to toss that into a text editor. I'm going to separate the first line, the title, and the second line, um, all of the remaining information about the article. 
by a, a tab ultimately and I'm going to pull that data into one record with two fields and then I'm going to toss it into um, OpenRefine. Now, OpenRefine is essentially a, um, a tool like Excel, only it's way, way better. Uh, and as you can see at this point, I, I've broken um, my article information into two fields, one with the title and the other with everything else. And one of the great virtues of OpenRefine is that I can um, split this column in a very nice and elegant way. And so that is what I proceed to do. And as you can see at this point, I've split it into several authors, um, the volume, the issue, the year and so on. And at this point in the proceedings, I've also gone back to the um, original publication page and dragged in um, a URL for each of the PDFs. And so I'm now ready to think about trying to upload this data in a sensible manner to Wikidata. So we're in OpenRefine and the interesting thing about OpenRefine is that it has the possibility of linking to external um, databases and in particular I've linked it to Wikidata. And I'm uh, at this point I've gone through a process which is called reconciliation and I've used one column of my data to try and find the text of that column as labels, as Wikidata labels. And reconciliation hunts for those labels. And I give it a bit of a hand by telling it that in fact, it's a label that it's a, it's a Wikidata item that actually is a, has the Wikidata property of a scholarly article. And that makes it just a smidgen easier. And having hunted through Wikidata to find the articles, I'm very pleased to see that uh, it was not able to find any of those articles and so it's asking me if I wish to create new items. So I tick my way through all of those rows and say, yes, I do want you to create a new item for me. Thank you very much. And uh, at that point, um, I have the choice of moving from the row format to the schema format and I, the schema looks very, very like um, what you get when you um, are adding data to Wikidata. Now, I have to um, tell um, the process um, what my label is and what my description is. And I do that by yanking down uh, the label field and putting it into the thing opposite label. I have to tell it what the description is and of course it's scholarly article so I've got a series of 19 rows labeled with scholarly article I could have just typed that in but I've dragged it in as a as a uh, column now this looks exactly like you know very very like um, adding items to Wikidata and so the next thing that you're offered in Wikidata is do you want to add a statement yes I do now I start so I click the add statement and up pops uh, a box and I've started to add CIT and it gets completed for me because I can't add a statement unless it, it is actually a property of Wikidata. And the statement I want to add is one which is about the title of my article that I'm interested in. So I add title and, and up pops the, the Wikidata property and I click on it. That then opens this rectangular box to the right and it asks me what language I want to write my title in. I say English and I drag down um, the column title and put it in, in, in that rectangle. Um, I have the option to um, trash that you can see the little trash icon, icon beside the title. I don't want to. That's I'm happy with that. I then move on and add my next. Start adding my next statement, which happens to be published in. And when I, the words published in pop up, and I click on them again, I'll get a square rectangle. And again, I have the option to add data. This time, I'm going to start typing rather than dragging down something. 
And so I start typing Newtsia and I'm offered the choice of Newtsia journal or Newtsia plant. I choose Newtsia journal, but it just shows as Newtsia there. I move on, I try adding another statement, publication date, and again, uh, having clicked on publication date there, it offers me I, uh, a rectangular box, and this time I just yank down um, the column publication date, and I move on. Now, at this point, this is probably the critical point for all of uh, what I want to do in Wikidata. Um, at this point, I'm adding the um, statement about author name strings. Now, of course, my authors there, if you looked at them, um, uh, you'll have seen that Rye, it, one author string was Rye, comma, B, dot, L, dot. Now, that was a woman called Barbara Lai. She could have been represented by the author string Barbara Lai. She could have been um, represented by Barbara Lynette Rye, her full name. She could have been represented by Lai, comma, B, dot, L, as she was b dot l dot as she was here so all i have in the that those fields that are, are my author one author two author three author four all i have are name strings they are not authors at this point they are not linked to the wikidata uh, i need to try to um well I, I need to get them in as author strings before i can turn them into authors and people who are actually people in wikidata so I've written author name string. That's the um, st statement I'm going to try and complete. I drag down author one. I need to say that he is indeed author one or she is indeed author one. And then I go to the bottom again and it offers me the choice of adding a value. I want to add a further value, author two. I add the qualifier, series ordinal two. I grow, go to author, th I go to add value again and drag into the box that then pops up author three. I again choose a qualifier to add a qualifier. And again, I choose series ordinal and I put in three. And I then go again to value and add in author four and um, the series ordinal thing. And at that point, oh, well, at this point, I haven't shown it for all of the, the things. I have entered all the data I want to add to um, uh, Wikidata for this article. So let's see what I want to do next. I have added these properties. So um, I've added an instance of, it's an instance of a scholarly article. You've seen the title go in, the publication date, published in, volume, issue, pages, author name string with its several values. Um, it could be up to any number. On occasion, it's up to 16 at, at, at just depends on the article. Now, critical to all of this, and one of the things that you want for your um, reader ultimately, is some way of linking to the article itself. Now, all that the Newtsia site offers me is a URL to the PDF of um, the article. So all I can offer is a URL. So I've put it up in two forms, as URL and as full work available at URL, because you never quite know how somebody's going to hunt something up. So I'm now ready. I've now uploaded the data and I'm now ready to think about trying to turn that author name string into an author, into a person in Wikidata, uh, a, a person with instance Q5. Um, and the author I'm going to look for is Kevin R. Tealy. And there's a couple of things that are important here. One is that I've chosen Fuzzy Match. So I've written his name as Kevin R. Tealy. I know perfectly well that in um, um, Newtsia articles, he's going to be Tealy, comma, uh, K dot R dot. But I'm not going to choose all the varieties of possible names. Uh, when push comes to shove, I will to try and grab the very last one. But this software is really, really good. and um, it gets me a long way. So I look, first of all, with the full name or near to the full name, and I choose a fuzzy match. And I also choose to log in. It's a tool associated with um, Wikidata. And I log in with my Wikidata data ID, and it then uploads it in, in a simpler fashion than if I don't log in. But that's by the by. The fuzzy match is the important bit here. Moving on, uh, having hit the link, 
I sit and wait for a bit, as you do, uh, and it's found 105 publications. Now, what is more disconcerting is that it's actually ticked the first group. Uh, now, if you look closely, um, you can see that these are articles in physics journals. Um, so it's unlikely to be our boy. So we need to, typically when you're doing author disambiguation, uncheck group one. It is not necessarily the case it's the person you're after. So I do that automatically now. I uncheck all of group one. It's the only group that gets checked um, by the software. So thereafter, you're OK. It's a case of just ticking your way through where you, you want to be. Anyway, a lot of searching on this one. I only found two. Um, and down by, uh, I think we were in our 16th group and we were in miscellaneous by this stage, I actually find Kevin R. Tierley, which I tick, except that I probably should check to see whether he is my Kevin R. Tierley. Now, you've actually been given a lot of tools um, to check that. Um, the one that I use, if it's offered me, is the DOI, because the DOI typically gives you author affiliations, and that begins to tell you, after all, you know something about this person. I know he's been in WA for ages. I know he got his PhD in Victoria. Um, so I go to the DOI, and I find that, in fact, um, I, I get the names that we saw earlier, but they're all affiliated with Charles Sturt. But that's pretty promising. I know it's a New South Wales university, but it's an Australian university, and there's only one Kevin R. Tealy botanist in Australia anyway. So I know it's the person I'm after. So I'm happy with that, and I'm happy with the fact I've ticked it. But you do need to check. Um, well, this is about the same topic, and it's done with the same, um, the one that I've ticked is done with the same author. Uh, but you can see why the fuzzy match is really good. Here we don't have any full stops in the middle of k.r. dot. We've just got kr. And um, they're before the tealy and not after the tealy. Um, so we didn't have to hunt for all of those things. I'm ticking him. I'm not looking up the DOIs. And off we go. So, And we've now gone through all 105 items. And um, I'm offered um, some Wikidata persons. Um, who might be the person I'm after. There's an R. Tealy that I'm not interested in. He never abbreviates his name to R. Tealy. Um, and I'm not interested in K. Tealy. I, he may be a duplicate that needs to be merged, but I'm not going to fuss about him. Oh, no, it's probably our um, physicist with any luck. Uh, the one I'm going to choose is Kevin Tealy, Australian botanist. So I click on Kevin Tealy, Australian botanist, and the... Um, little blue mark on, goes to Kevin Tealy, and then I click Link Selected Works to Author. And by the time I tried to capture that screen, the work had been done. And what's really fabulous about it, I mean, not only is it replacing um, the name strings by um, the author name, and so now these articles are actually linked to Kevin Tealy, uh, curator at um, the Western Australian Herbarium or former curator at Western Australian Herbarium and current professor at, at um, UWA. Um, so I've managed to do that linkage, which is fabulous. Uh, they've been, you know, author name strings have been replaced by authors for him. But what's even more fabulous is the fact that this is a batch and I can undo it. As with everything in Wikipedia, I can undo what I have done. I can make corrections. I can make errors after error after error. I can always correct. And this is um, where you can see how I could have corrected that if that were wrong. I would just set up a delete batch and I would be there. So I, it doesn't matter if I make an error. Uh, but actually, I'm happy with these, so I'm moving on. And at this point, um, and this is this is the guts of it, really. This is why um, one wants to do all of that author disambiguation and loading up of Wikidata. I want to insert a Scolia um, um, template into my article. And what it produces is this bit that I've circled in red. Scolia has an author profile for Kevin Tealy. And because this article is itself li linked with Wikidata, all of that data that I've 
um, linked to Kevin Tierley is linked here. And when I press on Scolia, what do I get? Well, um, we get some pretty graphs. Um, and I can see that I've only got 68 of Kevin's articles up there, uh, way, way short of, of the number of articles he's pu published. Uh, lots of work yet to do, obviously, in Wikidata. Um, I can see some of his co-authors. And again, obviously, if I don't have the Wikidata up there, I can't see all of the authors. But it's still useful if you wish to see who he's working with and who his colleagues are. Probably more importantly for people using um, Wikipedia, though, is we've got what pops up first off is actually this list of publications. And we have a link to English Wikipedia, as you can see. We have a link to his ORCID ID, which may or may not be useful. Um, and we have what is apparently a link to um, the very first article, Principles for Creating a Single Authoritative List of World Species. Um, and But that's actually only a link to the Wikidata item. Well, only a sort of a link. Now, in this particular case, it's terrific because this very first article has a DOI. And if I press on the DOI, I will get to that article. So that is fantastic. I press on the DOI and what comes up? Um, it's an article in PLOS Biology, which is an open access journal. Um, I have an abstract. I have all the authors. I can click all the way through. I have all of the information there. And because it's open access, I actually can read the entire article, which is fabulous. So the DOI always takes you to the article, always takes you to an abstract. Um, it's a wonderful thing if you can provide it. We weren't able to. Uh, what? Let's take a look at, further look at our list of um, um, articles. And this is just four of them. Now, obvious, the American Journal of Botany will have a DOI, so that's terrific. Taxon will have a DOI. Sadly, two new species of Aversia, Delaniaceae, from Western Australia will not. Um, as you can see, all we can get at this point is um, the Q item for this um, article, which is not too terrific because what's it look like? Well, that's one statement in it, but there are many, many statements, and that's somewhere near the bottom. It's certainly a bridge too far for most of our readers in Wikipedia to expect them to do that. Nonetheless, it does get me there, as you can see. I have got two new species of Dylanaceae, uh, and um, I can get to the article ultimately. I'm hoping that um, Scolia will actually offer you not just the DOI, but later we'll start to offer you the URL as well at that point where we saw it, because um, to expect such um, of data savvy stuff from our readers in Wikipedia, I think is really expecting too much. A URL would be as good would be good as well as the DOI. So, what have we learned? Oops, I'm hoping to get there. Um, if nothing else, I really hope that if you're writing articles about ac academics, about people who've written papers, please insert a, a Scolia template. And having done so please try and see if you can populate that Scolia template by um, doing some author disambiguation. Uh, it's pretty easy. You just look it up and um, you do the tasks that I've suggested and they're not that hard. Uh, if that's all too hard, you could try just entering a single article for your favourite academic and at least getting something there to link to when you've um, inserted the Scolia template. And finally, if you're feeling brave, you can have a crack at getting started in Open Refine. I haven't tried to teach you about that. Uh, the best things um, are um, some various YouTube videos, and I think that's definitely your best bet. And so at this time, I think I'll say thank you very much and sign off. Um, oops. Oh dear, have I done that correctly? I've done that wrongly all the way through by some bizarre, for some bizarre reason. Um, damn. Let me find that myself. Was, right, sorry, okay. I, I, was, I was actually sharing your slide, so there was there might have been a bit of a delay between... I was trying to... Um, because um, 
your screen wasn't coming up, so I was sharing it from my screen, but I was trying to guess what you were <laughs> when you wanted me to move on to the next slide. So if there are apologies for any um, delays or, or lags or, you know, <laughs> so on uh, in, in those. But uh, yeah, that, that all, I think that all went quite well. Um, Toby's asked me a question. Um, the DOI gets you exactly where you want to go. The problem is with Newt's here is that it has no DOI, so I wasn't up, able to upload a DOI, Toby. And um, so what that meant was that I, or the best I could do was upload a URL, and unfortunately um, that doesn't automatically show uh, on Scolia, so you have to go through Wikidata to get it, which is, you know, as I said in my talk, uh, one bridge too far, I think. I don't know what on earth anybody managed to see. Sorry there. Thanks, Alex, for your efforts. I don't know why I'm invisible, but <laughs> oh, good, Toby, thanks. Um, right, so, oh, oh, Liam. <laughs> um, really, probably all I'm trying to say is put up Scolia, um, put up your Scolia template. Um, um, uh, even if it's a paywalled article, oh, sorry, too many things. Um, put up your Scolia template, and someone else will people it for you with any populate it for you with any luck. Um, as for the um, the DOI, um, it may be behind a paywall, Siobhan, but um, it still gets you to an abstract. And if you're in a university setting, you can get there. The abstract takes you some way to knowing what the article is about. And of course, if it's just a Wikipedia article, one of the things that adding the Scolia template does is that you have immediately some sense of the total breadth of somebody's work. And I think that's really fabulous. And one of the things about Scolia at this point, about Wikidata at this point, is that there are some 30, I think there's 30 million, they've put up, someone's put up all the PubMed articles. And um, so if, if the person you're talking about or wanting to look at is a medical researcher, doing author disambiguation on that person is really useful. Um, I did one for Maria Byrne for, um, um, Annie the other day, and I was able to add a hundred articles via author disambiguation, and I took her from I think 30 to 130 in no time flat. She's got more than 200 articles, I think, um, and I just did that through author dis doing using the author disambiguation. So somehow or other, most of her articles were already in Wikidata. The thing is with um, I mean, it, it's showing the breadth. Yes, there is a paywall, but um, that's the best you can do. You've still got to the article, and it means that you can see what the article's about, whether you either want to pay for it or get to it in some other way. Um, oh, dear. I keep looking at Liam's thing saying, I'm so <laughs> really, I'm just putting up Wikidata, Liam, um, and I'm putting it up in bulk. Um, and um, if you want to put it up in bulk, Open Refine isn't a bad tool and it isn't bad to try to learn about it. Um, so uh, I, it was sort of just saying, um, and if you don't know about a tool, you can't begin to try to learn about it. So it was really just an introduction to say, here's a fabulous tool, you can learn about it, YouTube's pretty good. So sorry about that. And I did rather bolt because I was worried about time. Is there anything else there? Well, speaking of open refine, um, what do you think are the the biggest pitfalls or hurdles for people starting to use that open refine tool that you showed oh. right at the beginning of the talk? <laughs> ah, well, it, it, uh, one of the things that bugged me, I'd uploaded a whole pile of stuff originally. And um, for some reason, my publication dates were um, numeric. And uh, publication dates have to be um, um, characters, otherwise you can't upload them. Uh, and I kept failing to upload this stuff. And I, I have uploaded at least four volumes of Nutia prior to this. I couldn't work out what had happened. I thought, um, I thought it was that I'd gone to a new version of Open Refine. It wasn't anything to do that with that. It was just that I had the wrong format. I think you have to be prepared to bungle. You have to be prepared to sit about. You have to be prepared to um, watch yet, an, you know, the same old um, YouTube video and go, what have I done wrong here? 
Um, it all works remarkably well, but it's, it's, it does take a degree of persistence. I think before you're going to hit open refine, obviously you are going to upload um, um, various articles beforehand. So at least you know that you're going to want to add, um, you know, the, um, um, the Wikidata property publication date that you're going to know that you're going to op wish to upload a statement saying instance of. Um, so you need to know what kind of statements you're going to wish to upload uh, before you start to segment your data. Um, the, the process of segmenting the data is really, really simple. What tends to throw you more is once you've linked with Wikidata exactly what the hell you're supposed to do, which I did go through in some detail there and I think somewhat better than I've seen in other presentations, but possibly not, given that um, um, I was, Alex was lagging behind my ripping through the <laughs> slides. Oh dear. Yes. Um, so I should have had key... you uh, to give me a signal like coughing or something to... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no. I look at it and go, I've run out of words. On to the next. Quick. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, Alex. Thanks, Thomas. Um, I'll hang about. <laughs> thanks, Margaret. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, we've got um, uh, we're, we've got another talk scheduled, but um, I haven't uh, got those people uh, available yet. So we might uh, skip ahead to Amanda Lawrence. Um, Amanda's a researcher and librarian um, who works in the areas of research of uh, research communications, media, and publishing systems, digital collecting, um, open scholarship, grey literature, uh, which is what she's going to be talking about today. Uh, knowledge infrastructure and public policy. Uh, she's currently completing a PhD on research communications and public policy in the media communications department at RMIT University. I hope that wasn't out of date. I got it from your um, orchid, I think. <laughs> um, Amanda was the director of analysis and policy of, of the Analysis and Policy Observatory, uh, an award-winning public, public policy research database uh, from 2006 to 2018, where she's secured and managed a number of research Australian Research Council linkage and infrastructure grants. Amanda's worked in various roles in the book and cultural sector, including establishing the literature residency program and the author touring program at the AsiaLink Centre at the University of Melbourne. So uh, I'll hand you over to um, uh, Amanda, who's going to um, uh, give, give us a presentation on the challenge of institution published grey literature. Um, I'll Great. Thanks, Alex. Uh, maybe make the, um, I think I'm quite large, so if you want to make the slides a little bit bigger, yeah, okay, yeah, great, get rid of me entirely, fantastic. Uh, so, um, yes, thanks for that introduction, I didn't uh, realise you were going to, um, I'm not sure where that bio came from, it is uh, still accurate, although um, uh, submission is hopefully going to occur very soon for my PhD, and then this week I'm hoping. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks everybody for um, joining in this session. Uh, I, I'd just like to say first up that um, I'm not really much of a Wikidata, Wikisite or even Wikipedia expert. Uh, I have, I'm, I'm a total dabbler. Um, so I can't really, uh, so, you know, Margaret's presentation was uh, pretty, uh, a, a bit advanced for me. Um, but I do know a fair bit about grey literature, so um, uh, I'm going to focus on that and focus on uh, how why it's really important and why we need to think about how we can get it into um, wiki data and wiki site. Uh, so, firstly, so just uh, I'll just talk for 15 minutes, um, uh, a little bit of an overview of uh, what we're talking about here. Um, and then some of the kinds of publications we might be wanting to deal with and uh, what the sort of referencing issues might, there might be and the data model and um, some of the challenges that are involved. So firstly, um, I think Daniel already mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so the, the reason why I, I want to bring this in is uh, to have a think about uh, just the scale, the complexity, the diversity of uh, topics, of institutions, of uh, 
um, people, of countries, of types of research or research methods um, that would be involved in trying to address these goals. It is not going to be done simply by academic journal articles, although they are going to be important. It's also going to involve um, electoral data, it's going to involve economic data, it's going to involve government uh, research, it's going to involve um, thousands of NGOs and um, think tanks and consultants, etc. So uh, if we want to be a source of information and for the sustainable development goals, we need to expand our idea of um, where research is located. Um, so I, I came across recently uh, this term requisite variety and I really like it. It um, uh, comes from a sort of computing um, basis. So uh, some of the audience may be familiar with it. Um, it, was, it was new to me. Uh, and it's also being adopted by people looking at sort of evidence-based policy and how we might um, think about that. So the quote is, an effective evidence ecosystem would seem to need a requisite variety of initiatives to encourage and enable evidence use. That is, the repertoire of initiatives to promote evidence use needs to be at least as varied and nuanced as the policy and practice contexts that are being targeted. So the point is that uh, the kinds of resources that we're going to need are going to have to be probably as uh, complex and diverse as the problems that we face. And therefore, the computing system that we uh, provide is also going to need to be fairly complex. Uh, so the kinds of reports that we might be thinking about in this context of um, of the sustainable development goals and climate change, et cetera, uh, include reports from the IPCC itself, clearly peer reviewed. Uh, so it's not true that uh, research reports from organizations aren't, or aren't peer reviewed. Um, UN Environment Program, biodiversity issues, and uh, you know, World Bank major um, uh, quasi-government organisations and international non-government organisations. There's also um, a huge variety of reports are produced uh, by um, at a national, at a local level, all around the world. So these examples are all from Australia, uh, but they include um, research centres, often research centres in collaboration with other, with both companies and NGOs. Um, uh, advocacy, advocacy groups, government research centres, etc. So my uh, concept of what we're dealing with here is that if we think about there's research and there's research communication and scholarly communication is a subset of that, uh, but so is research publishing and they kind of overlap. There's commercial academic publishing and there's organisation research publishing. Uh, so a lot of what we have on Wikisite and Wikidata is commercial academic publishing. There's also market research publishing, uh, you know, where you can pay thousands of dollars to, to get access to a, a market research report. And there's uh, substantial uh, but still relatively small non-profit academic publishing. So the open access movement, open, uh, diamond open access journals, etc. cetera. Uh, so if we think about what, uh, might be then included on Wikidata and Wikisite. We need to think beyond books and journals to think about reports, technical reports, uh, evaluations. The, the, um, it, it's not quite clear what that um, re, uh, type is referring to. There's policy briefs and briefings, again, not very well defined on Wikidata. Uh, discussion papers, uh, it's, it's on Wikidata, but actually it, uh, to my mind is the wrong definition. Uh, white papers uh, produced by consultants and um, governments as well. Systematic reviews, um, again, on Wikidata, that's kind of looks a bit like a topic. It's actually got a topic uh, reference to the Library of Congress. Um, so something, a, a, lot of, a lot of publications are both can be topics as well as publication types. So we need to kind of make sure we're not getting those things confused. Um, literature reviews, review articles, there's lots of those. Uh, it's not quite clear exactly what that's referring to. 
case studies, um, but uh, the the um, type there is actually referring to a research method rather than a, a case study as a publication. Preprints, working papers, um, a case report uh, that's a medical report, um, and scholarly articles. So there's a there's it's just a sample of what we might be wanting to. Um, work on and, and create references for in Wikidata. So uh, on the topic of climate change, um, uh, there are actually you know, thousands of publications. So this is using Scolio to see what was available on Wikidata in terms of um, diverse kinds of content. And uh, when you when you have a look at that, you've got a lot of scholarly articles and then uh, a lot of review articles. If we get rid of the scholarly articles and the review articles, we've actually got uh, on, in, on the topic of climate change, one report a year for the last few years and maybe maybe two. Or, um, so there's a, an incredible un, uh, lack of representation of uh, the kinds of material that we would want to see on Wikidata about climate change that um, would be very relevant. Um, on the other hand, uh, a, a source like APO has got um, 1,400 uh, reports on climate change. And I, I really sort of show this mainly to um, just to confirm to people that the reports are out there. It's not that the reports aren't there and it's not that they aren't um, important and substantial. Um, research reports, as the examples given here from the, you know, a climate change roundtable, uh, development roundtable, uh, the Ministry for Environment from New Zealand. So we're, we're not necessarily dealing with um, uh, insubstantial, unverifiable research. It's um, a lot of really substantial material. And also the um, something about APO is to have a look at the diverse kinds of documents that are also there, conference papers, discussion papers, working papers, strategies, uh, briefings, articles, guides, fact sheets, policy reports. So there's a there's a lot of diversity within this um, within this area. Uh, so this diversity is kind of pretty problematic because it's um, it's never really been worked out. So uh, there are various attempts uh, underway at the moment to develop ontologies for different sort of uh, genres, um, and even even the word genre on on Wikidata is seems to be used for literary kinds kinds of content rather than um, all sorts of publication types, which is sort of how they're more usually used. Um, so there's uh, so there's another pr number of projects looking at this. Um, it would be great to see a project looking specifically at uh, kind of report literature or organisation publications. I actually prefer not to use grey literature, um, but I use it because uh, it, it's a uh, it, it's understandable for um, a certain segment of the um, community. But if we think of organisation publications, I think it's the easiest way of thinking about it. Um, so the Confederation of Open Access Repositories has um, made an attempt to create a vocabulary um, and that's referenced on Wikidata. Um, uh, some, of, some of those are, are, are really useful. Um, that actually is interesting, you know, a lot of these ontologies sort of refer cross-reference to each other. Um, but uh, so uh, the core... Uh, vocabulary reference is a GISC one from 2008. Uh, the Library of Congress has also got an extensive genre form vocabulary. Um, it, the Library of Congress sort of has a little bit of a um, bias towards books. Um, in fact, most, um, most of these ontologies have a bit of a bias towards books. Um, so they often uh, miss the, the, the policy area has a lot of um, publication types of its own special nature. Uh, Schema.org is very random, I, I think, in what it chooses to um, um, create a, a genre for. Uh, so that can be used to a certain extent. Um, but yes, yeah, something interesting. So the, the working paper definition in um, the 
Confederation of Open Access Repositories actually describes it as unpublished documents. Uh, it references the JISC uh, scheme, which actually describes a working paper as a published document. So, uh, you know, even, even if it's referencing the same thing, it can actually have the opposite definition. So, um, so there's really quite a, a bit more work that needs to be done here. Um, but uh, having, having kind of talked about all the, the complexity uh, and differences, we can absolutely look to books as a guide to a lot of what we would want to be using for um, describing a lot of these materials. They are documents, so uh, they are, you know, they have a title, they have an author. The author is often multiple authors, often institutional authors. Um, uh, it, it, it's, you need to think about the instance, so it's a publication, a report, a working paper, a technical report. It could even be multiples of those. Um, uh, the title, the subtitle, the description, the publishers, the publishers often an organisation, often multiple organisations, uh, so the organisation itself may need to be added in the country, um, the publication date, uh, that can be confusing. It's interesting to look at um, uh, the IPCC report uh, has, at least one I looked at, had two dates. This can be the case with government documents where um, the report has got a date of, say, November of one year, but it actually doesn't get released until, you know, February of the following year. Um, uh, the topic, so there are vast numbers of topics. So the topic is is going to be quite complex. And uh, I think, you know, that's, that's a, a big issue uh, that Wiki, Wikisite needs to address is how we look at um, getting some sort of... Um, uh, topic, uh, vocabulary that we can use. Um, uh, the URL to the full article, um, uh, so this is why I asked the question, where, where where do we go to and what's going to happen? A lot of this material is published online by the, pub, by the organisation and it doesn't remain stable. Uh, so this is, this is a big problem. Uh, the full work where that might be available, uh, various identifiers. So some of a lot of reports do have identifiers, a lot of reports don't. Um, some that might have multiple identifiers. Um, I, I have tried putting using identifiers to put things in, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So even with an identifier, it might not pull in any content. Um, the language is a part of a series, a collection, etc. So we can, um, the, you know, there's a really strong basis to uh, develop an, a, a data model for different kinds of documents based on books, but we also need to think about the, the differences. Um, so this is, yeah, the, the, uh, this is an example where it's actually got two publication dates. I'm, I'm not quite sure why, but, you know, it's interesting that that's possible. Uh, you can also sort of say that uh, something follows or is followed by, uh, so this is part of a series. Um, so it's the case with the IPCC. It doesn't actually have any topics on it for this one, uh, so that's a, that's a real shame. Um, another example, the Finch report. So uh, this is a good a good example where it's really important to put the um, uh, the uh, alternative title. So although the name of this report is Accessibility, Sustainability, Ex Excellence, it's generally known as the Finch report, which is the case with a lot of um, uh, you know major government reports. Um, and I. Uh, yeah, so that's this is a general guide. Just be, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was, I was gonna. I, I was looked at the link for the Finch report, and it's um, it, it's not a dead link. It goes to. It's a moved link. So the content for it has um, been moved. I'll just if I can do this. Yeah. So if we go to the live um, the live page. This. Uh, it, it's got a link here. This actually goes to this page. So it's still sort of, a, a, it's still a page. It might not register as a dead link, but uh, as you can see, there's no copy of um, the Fritz report. And in fact, you know, you try and look it up and well, you think you've got it, but actually this is the government's response to the Finch report. And uh, from what I can gather, uh, gov.uk doesn't have a copy of the Finch report. 
Um, you can find it on this website. I'm not really quite sure what this website is about, but anyway, they do have a copy of the Fisher Report, so whoa, fantastic. Um, this uh, so semantic scholar has also got a copy of the Finch Report, which apparently has got a DOI. Oh, yay, fantastic! Yeah, no, DOI is not found. So this is this is a wild west of verifiability for uh, something that is you know like a, a extremely important uh, government report in in terms of open access policy. Uh, so I'll just finish up um, and am I going for time? Probably going over now. Um, so, yeah, just we can start to sort of think about what kind of um, standard guide we could put together to help people um, uh, catalogue these sorts of materials. Uh, I'd be really interested in working on that. There's a lot of challenges in this area. So um, uh, multiple departments, name changes are a huge problem with machinery of government changes in government. Um, uh, there's often multiple organisations. Um, uh, often, you know, whole groups are mentioned. It's really hard to work out who actually are any of them authors. There's often no identifiers. There may be multiple identifiers. There may be identifiers that actually don't even work anymore. Uh, copyright is often missing. Um, so it would, you know, depend on the jurisdiction you're in as to what that means. In Australia, that means automatically all rights reserved. Um, uh, you know, you can have different copyright durations depending on something is published or unpublished. So we've only just in the last uh, couple of years got a, a duration for um, unpublished works. Um, and there's often missing information, you know, no date, no author, no publisher, no location, no identifier, um, sometimes not even a title. It's quite incredible. Um so, yeah, just have a think if you're ever publishing online to make sure that, you know, it, it will float around by itself. Uh, uh, so, you know, there, there's a lot of potential here. There's, there's actually such an enormous amount of material that um, it's, we, we really need to be looking at bulk import uh, and, and how to be doing that. Um, a lot of uh, organisations uh, like the UN, the w WHO, World Bank have very well organised collections. Um, they're not necessarily all that great for um, doing systematic review searches on and so actually um, there's an enormous need for a, a large-scale database where you can systematically review the, the literature on various um, on, on any topic, and being able to do that and include the major research reports is a is a serious issue. There is no large-scale collection doing that at the moment. Um, there's lots of small ones. There is a new I, I should have put on. There's a new project called Policy Commons, which um, I'm sort of vaguely involved with. Um, and uh, so that's that's one option coming along, uh, but it, it's a real opportunity for Wikidata and Wikisite uh, if we can work out how to how to do it at scale. Um, uh, then the you know institutional repositories have actually often got uh, some level of of content that would might be able to be mined. Um, the British Library has a really great collection of reports. So there, there are various databases, but they tend to be um, small to medium sized and having sort of, uh, you know, a certain segment. So there is a real need for an overarching coordinating um, uh, collection in this space. Okay, sorry, I hope I didn't go over time. I think I might have gone over time. Uh don't worry at all. That's totally fine. Um, as mentioned earlier in the uh, in the session, we've unfortunately had a no show from one of our presenters. So we are reshuffling the presenter order currently, and we've actually got a couple of questions for you, Amanda, that have been added into the Etherpad. Um, so the first of those was a, a definitional question. Actually, what's what do you reckon is wrong with the Wikidata definition of discussion paper? Oh, um, uh, so oh, I'd have to look it up again. Um, I think it was that it, um, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. 
Uh, no, my thing is not going to do anything. Um, uh, I yes, yeah, sorry. I think it was that it um, presumed to be coming from um, a, a a very much a research angle um, and uh, wasn't wasn't. Um, Sorry, my computer's not finding it for me. Uh, no, sorry, I'm not getting, I'm not getting it up. <laughs> um, yes, that it, the sorry, that it was coming from a, the perspective of a, a research discussion paper, um, like preliminary findings, that sort of thing. Uh, whereas actually, a discussion paper in a political context. Um, is often or, or in a research sort of public discussion context is a lot more about kind of presenting um, ideas and policies uh, for feedback. So just just the nuancing around um, a lot of a lot of the definitions come from um, an academic perspective and don't really take account of a, a, a policy or an organization perspective. Mm. Um, and there was actually uh, an additional question um, about the APO um, taxonomy. So it asks, uh, has the APO term taxonomy changed? Um, the link that uh, the questioner had to climate change now returns a 404 error. Um, so there's an example, uh, they, they add the link in the etherpad. Uh, it, it may have. They've actually. Um, so I haven't worked there for um, uh, uh, nearly two years. Um, so I'm not responsible for for that um, anymore. And they have actually kind of created a new taxonomy, um, a public policy sort of subset taxonomy, which has been added to um, Research Data Australia, uh, their the taxonomy list. And uh, so it may have been that they've been changed yeah so I that's that's all I can say um, I also wanted to, to second the comment that you made about um, the, the difficulties in this wild west of, of verifiability um, I was working um, on a project that required me to look at a particular report a while back and not only did that report, of course, not have a DOI or any stable um, uh, identifier like that, it didn't have a stable URL that pointed to it, and it didn't even have a stable title. So it was published, uh, it, it appeared in multiple different places under different variant spellings of its title. And so in many ways, Wikidata is actually more vital for these sorts of items than it even is for um, uh, you know, academic journal publications and books, which already at least have some stability in their citability. And actually for a lot of the, the organization published literature and reports and, and gray literature, actually Wikidata might end up being the primary, um, the, the primary location for collating that sort of information. I think so. Well, I think, um, so my feeling is that there will be um, various uh, small, smaller scale collections uh, because of the niche, air, niche nature of it. Um, but the, it's really difficult to do any, um, you know, search at scale, particularly um, like if you're doing a systematic review, you actually want to be able to, because you can do large scale uh, searches of databases, what you really want to be able to do is separate out, okay, we've got all the journal co articles covered, what what do we need to find out that's not a journal article? You know, how do we actually search everything that's not a journal article? And that is, you cannot do that on Google, you can't do that on, or Scholar, you can't do that on Microsoft Academic. Um, a lot of the databases you can't really sort of differentiate from I don't want to see journal articles. And then when you do get good big collections like the WHO, you can't, uh, you can't run specialist queries on them. 
So I, I had a project uh, last year looking at digital health, and I was given this sort of, you know, string of, you know, 10 different um, terms that I was meant to sort of run in on, on, um, on various aspects of digital health that you would you can put into um, like a commercial academic database um, or or some of the sort of systematic review software systems. And the, the, every time I would run this string on a on another database like WHO, I'd get nothing, absolutely nothing, because it it just couldn't. You know, you had to actually go back to just find digital health. You know, no no ex, any other extra qualifiers. So then there's really a desperate need for an overarching aggregator, um, but also one that's able to be able to have a lot more complex metadata, you know, around re research methods and all that sort of thing that, that could sort of start to be added into records for different content um, so that that can be reused. Fantastic. Thanks, Amanda, uh, very much for that. Um, all right, um, we're, uh, so as, I, as mentioned before, a bit of a change to the schedule. Um, I'm gonna, th uh, gonna throw to uh, my co-host, Thomas, who's going to um, uh, uh, do a talk on how open can you make metadata? So a bit of an intro, uh, I'm sure most of you know him already, but uh, Thomas is a data specialist at uh, La Trobe University with a background in evolutionary biochemistry. Um, his professional role focuses in open data and open research outputs across the university, ranging from data analysis and visualization to sharing and dissemination. He also helps to run the WikiJournal user group, a small publishing group of open access Wikipedia integrated academic journals, and is an experienced editor of Wikipedia and Wikidata. So, uh, Thomas, I'll uh, hand over to you. Thank you very much, and I shall stick my screen share up. Um, so apologies for the infinite recursion until I change away from the StreamYard view. Um, so one of the things that I've been interested in with the way that Wikidata works is that we actually have the opportunity to include a lot more metadata than we normally would see involved in uh, a site such as uh, Crossref or um, in PubMed. In addition to all of that information, we have this opportunity to do a lot more annotation, some of it manually, but hopefully a lot of it in an automated fashion. And so I'm gonna use this um, article here as a brief example of some of that. Um, so this is an article that was published in the Wiki Journal of Medicine. Um, and this is uh, for those who haven't come across the Wiki Journals before. Um, these are academic journals that are hosted on the same software that Wikipedia and other wikis are. So that media wiki software. And it actually affords a couple of benefits um, in terms of interacting with Wikidata. So they're actually quite a nice um, case example. So the first thing to note is that this is all formatted up like you would expect in you know, many another um, uh, academic journal with authors. You've got an abstract, the um, text down at the bottom, um, and then on the right hand side, the various bits of metadata like it's PDF and DOI and, and so on and so forth. Um, additionally, because the wiki journals focus on um, open publishing and transparency. Also, the editors are indicated, and in fact, their roles as editors, um, and also the peer reviewers are indicated. Um, and if we go through to the peer review page, because the peer review comments are also open, it gives a little bit more information about those. But the interesting thing here is that all of this information on the right hand side, and these authors up at the top, are, all of that information isn't stored on this page for those who are used to working with um, uh, with media wiki and looking at source code you might expect that all of these are uh, included as parameters of a template actually present on this page but they're not they're actually all stored in wikidata and called from wikidata to populate up this page and that wikidata item is here so again this is the same title and you can see on the right hand side that it links to the wiki journal article as its um, uh, as its main um, wikimedia foundation wiki page um, and it has some of the standard information that you might expect so it indicates that it's an in uh, instance of a scholarly article um, and indicates title um, the keywords uh, are a 
pretty standard as well that you might expect for other databases. So in this case, it's an article about burns. It's about a, a particular metric of total body surface area, which is a metric of burn severity. Um, and then two different ways of estimating TBSA, burn case 3D, and the Lund uh, Browder chart. Um, OK, so far, so normal. Um, we also have the authors listed, but one thing that we're starting to see that is unusual for Wikidata's way of storing author information is firstly, we already have an email address string here to indicate the corresponding author. Um, there has been a general discussion on Wikidata about whether to include in individuals' Wikidata items their email address if that email address is open. So for example, in this particular author, if we follow through to the Wikidata item about them, they are a researcher, it does not include their email address here. It does include their ORCID ID. And from their ORCID, you can go to their publications. And from their publications, they are a corresponding author on some of them. And that corresponding authorship will have associated with it an email address. But typically, it's it, it's not considered standard to include someone's email address actually in their um, the item about them. However, it I think is reasonable to include an email address for a corresponding author on the Wikidata item about that output. Additionally, we have affiliation strings listed. Um, I think actually the better way of doing this instead of affiliation string is to use uh, affiliation and specifically point to the item for Hanil, um, Hanil General Hospital. The reason that it's formatted up as a string currently um, is for um, it being pulled into this article here and formatting up correctly um, in the um, uh, uh, in the information about those authors. However, eventually all of this is going to be a bit more automated. So the affiliation string is uh, going to instead be replaced with an affiliation, or indeed the information may be able to be pulled straight from that author's item as to where their employer is and in what country that employer is based. But now we get into the more unique information. So um, I think one of the nice examples here is the reviewed by uh, field, where we can indicate the information about the peer reviewers. Now, again, I've mentioned wiki journals are unusual in that they have both the peer review comments and uh, many of the peer review identities open. So about 75% of peer reviewers um, agree to have their identities open. And we can see an example here for Herbert Haller. Um, but we also are able to do something useful even for anonymous peer reviewers. So in this particular case, we have this anonymous peer reviewer, but we are able to at least include what's their field of study um, and also what are their academic degrees. So was this particularly for medical articles, is this being reviewed by a, an MD or a PhD? And in this particular case, it was uh, someone who had expertise in both. Um, but you might imagine that there's a multi, uh, an interdisciplinary article, and you would like to be able to indicate um, which of those disciplines are covered by the peer reviewers. Let's say uh, this is quite a, a monodisciplinary article, um, but let's say that there was an article about um, burns, pharmacology, and genomics. You would want to be able to indicate, even if you had two anonymous peer reviewers, well, did those peer reviewers' expertise cover all of those topics? Or was there a big gap because none of them actually had any expertise in genomics and therefore you wouldn't expect them to be able to pick up significant um, errors in the genomics aspect of that paper? So this information is typically not open for most um, academic journals, which I think is a great pity. Um, and I also think it's a pity that typically uh, peer reviewer comments aren't just um, aren't just secret, but they're permanently secret. So there's no, it's not as though they're under embargo and will eventually be released. Most peer reviewer comments are secret uh, forever. And in fact, many journals no longer even keep record, uh, no longer have records for all of the peer reviewer comments and author responses that they have for older articles. So I was speaking to one journal where they'd moved offices about a decade ago, and they'd, all of the um, uh, all of the 
peer reviewer comments that were older than about 30 years. They just lost all of those paper documents and they couldn't find them again. So we've lost all of that information that would actually be quite useful. Um, and one of my hopes is that eventually journals that do decide to go a closed and secret peer review route um, at least have those on file somewhere so that they can be put under a long term embargo, because I know you know, uh, secrets about the nuclear warship activities of the UK and America that have been released um, after embargo periods when we don't know the peer reviewer comments on some of the very significant publications um, that are now uh, old enough that they really should be, uh, that information really should be entering the public domain. Uh, additionally, you'll notice here that this peer reviewer has the quality of a declared conflict of interest. One of the things that we haven't yet worked out the best way of structuring is how to link to the, the specific statement of that declared conflict of interest. I think in this particular um, scenario, it's going to be best to add an additional qualifier down here just with a URL pointing to the statement of that declared conflict of interest. But I'd be interested in other people's opinions of how to best structure the specific um, conflict of interests that reviewers or authors bring up. Um, and additionally, um, I want to quickly note um, the handling editors here. So uh, editorial staff for a journal vary. So some of them will be handling editors and we've indicated those handling editors here. Um, additionally, for articles that have um, detailed um, uh, detailed statistical methodology, it's becoming more common to ensure that at least one experienced statistician has a look at that publication to make sure that all of the stats in, are in order. In this particular case, again, we've indicated the editor who had that role. But you could also imagine putting in editor roles for typesetters and copy editors um, to recognize the work that has gone into um, producing that final nicely formatted PDF that a journal can put out, as well as the work that goes into checking the, the language content. Um, the only role that I've seen consistently recognized is for journals that, ha that translate into multiple languages, um, having the role of translator well documented. Um, but even that is, is not um, universal. Um, and the the last things that I wanted to quickly get to about on this page is some of the significant events. Um, okay, submission is a pretty standard one, but I think that it's useful to also include in Wikidata items more open information about um, ethics approval, uh, because I think that that's pretty important to know. Uh, firstly, whether ethics approval has been given for a, particular, for a particular piece of work and also um, who conferred it. Um, and in fact, eventually, I suspect that we're going to want to not just link to um, uh, the organization that conferred ethics approval, but conceivably, if that organization has multiple different ethics boards, um, and universities will often have this, they'll have low risk ethics boards and high risk ethics boards or different ethics boards for medical, non-medical science and um, humanities research. They'll, have, they'll separate out those ethics boards. So being able to indicate which of those ethics boards gave approval, I think is also going to start being quite important for works in general. Um, and the last thing I wanted to point out here um, is I think that we have a methodologies section here. Yes, describes a project that uses. So again, um, uh, we are able to link to both methodologies and also conceivably instrumentation. So in this particular case, there was no specific instruments that were um, used. But unsurprisingly, um, this article about burns use, uh, comparing different measures uses those measures. So in particular, we're able to say, oh, well, it's able to, it's using this particular piece of software, burn case 3D. And in fact, we can state how they got that piece of software. So in this case, they didn't purchase that piece of software. It was actually donated by uh, one of the developers of that software. And the same thing goes for the methodologies. So you can um, see some of the methodologies listed here. And this would also allow you to then search the literature for if you're planning on using a particular methodology, finding 
uh, instances in the literature of other works that use that methodology, or if a particular methodology has been found to have uh, a significant flaw, and uh, being able to search through the literature um, for that um, uh, for that flaw. But also in terms of instrumentation, you might imagine a physics publication that used a specific particle accelerator. So the closest particle accelerator to me is at Monash University. Um, and we might find that actually there'd been a miscalibration of that particle, ac uh, particle accelerator between uh, March and July of 2019. And so we could search for all of the publications that came out of work that used that particle accelerator between those two dates. Um, and so you can see how this is actually quite extensible um, to enrich the metadata about these publications in a way that is extremely unusual for journal articles. Um, and so we can actually see that um, uh, an additional uh, extension of the use of that information over here. So this is one of the volumes of the Wiki Journal of Science. And again, all of these items here have all of this information pulled from Wikidata. Um, so the way that it's pulling these um, uh, these abstracts is because Wikidata knows the URL of this particular um, item, it's able to go to that URL and pull out the first par uh, the the abstract um, paragraph, and then display this abstract paragraph here. And then all of the rest of this information is directly hosted um, within the Wikidata item for it. And this is, of course, the example for published items, but even articles in process. So here is our open. Um, uh, publica uh, publication processing board. And you can see again, all of these preprint items that are in process have all of this information drawn directly from Wikidata. So there's the Wikidata, uh, um, uh, Wikidata item and the link to the preprint itself, but then its submission date, who are the handling editors, does it have any peer reviewers um, uh, listed yet? Oh, that one interestingly is incorrect. Um, but these other ones have uh, correctly list the peer reviewers that have been um, uh, produced, uh, that have submitted their peer reviewer comments. And then for, uh, for accepted articles, you can see uh, whether they had a DOI assigned yet. Uh, for those that are intended to be integrated back into Wikipedia, whether that's occurred yet, um, and whether a PDF has been created. Um, and then obviously articles that are finished in that process have um, their row removed. So I'm going to quickly talk about a project that is looking at some of this way to, to look uh, to produce more detailed information um, around publications, uh, which is this um, Stardit uh, concept. So this is a standardized data on initiatives. Um, and I'm going to be talking about it specifically from the point of view of um, uh, academic research and research publications, although uh, bear in mind that it's more generally extensible and that it's, it's designed to be extensible to initiatives in general. So this might be items that are never published and are um, citizen science um, uh, works or you know, even more broadly than that. But from a research, uh, a research publication or research outputs point of view, um, here is a mapping of the existing um, Stardit report system, which I'll show you an example in a moment. It's a rather bland PDF, um, but the best mapping between those categories over to various Wikidata um, items, and also whether they are compulsory within a Stardit form or whether they're optional. So that eventually um, for an article like this, so this is a, um, uh, a research article about involving um, uh, people affected with a genomic condition in the research about that genomic condition. And one of its supplementary items, in addition to a GRIP report, so some people may have seen GRIP reports before, uh, a Stardit report uh, has also been included. Um, and it looks like this, so this rather uninspiring um, alpha version, um, and it's just a, a plain PDF. But even just skimming this PDF, you'll be able to see that actually a lot of this is very structured data and should in fact be included in a machine readable format rather than in a PDF format. Um, and so step one was um, recapitulating all of this information on a wiki. Um, and so in this particular case, it, uh, we're using Wikispore, which is 
um, a project for for small and experimental um, wikis to to test out um, ideas before perhaps spinning off their own um, full project. So in this case, here's the started item, and this is just a, essentially a copy paste of all of that information from the PDF, uh, but in a way that is going to start allowing us to replace these items eventually with information from the Wikidata item. Um, and so in this particular case, we've got the Wikidata item actually for this preprint here. So this preprint here has a DOI, um, and this is the Wikidata item for that preprint. Um, and again, starting to introduce way more information about those authors. So for example, the author roles. So whether uh, in this particular case, this author is not only a representative um, author, uh, doing the research themselves, but they're also specifically there in their capacity of being affected by the topic of the research, and they're involved in the design, data analysis, and member checking, um, and additional information around other authors, and indeed authors who don't have uh, an item yet and are just included as author name strings. Um, but also this work um, had the, had contributors, specifically it had a group of 25 contributors who gave feedback on it, um, and those contributors were affected by the topic of this research. Um, and again, we've got information about the um, ethics approval, but also um, significant events around this. Um, so information about, for example, when this report was actually written and who was the author of the report. Uh, as, um, uh, and additionally, what material was produced. And in particular, I think that it's quite interesting to talk about the data that is produced because, again, we're very interested in being able to openly uh, catalog that data um, as it comes out. And so in this particular case, there's data that's produced, some of which um, has, uh, is sensitive data, um, and some of which is non-sensitive data. So that's um, the data that is sensitive is kept confidential. And we can talk about also what type of um, access restriction it has. So in this particular case, it's mediated access, which means that you can get access to it, but you need permission from the owners. And in this particular case, it is owned by the research participants and the research inst uh, uh, researchers, and it's stored um, in servers at La Trobe University. Whereas the non-sensitive data um, is unrestricted access under this particular uh, copyright license. Um, it was published in the Open Access Journal, but specifically we can show the download link for that data um, and what file format that data is in. Um, I'm not going to go into any more detail on other examples, but I'm hoping you can see how much more information you're able to associate with items. Um, some of this is only possible if the researchers themselves start uh, including that information. Um, and so I'm hopeful that the idea of including these Stardit reports um, as part of publications uh, will become more common. Um, and to that end, um, this Stardit project is working on a simple front end that will allow people who don't have any Wikidata experience to be able to deposit that data directly into um, Wikidata when they submit their articles. Um, so I shall leave it there, and hopefully this has sparked a few ideas. Um, I've also put some open questions in the Etherpad uh, about how even best to store this data um, and what to do with things like free text around that um, and different ways of possibly structuring it. So I'll be interested in any questions that people have, um, and I shall stop my screen share at this point. Thanks. So we've got a question on the uh, Etherpad. I'll just uh, show it now. So um, our reviewers ever sh shy about showing ignorance in their questioning if they know their comments are open? There's actually been a couple of studies on that. Um, there's not any evidence that uh, reviewers are shy about their uh, the comments that they make, but um, there is some evidence that in some fields um, it becomes harder to attract a reviewer to give comments at all. So some uh, some journals have reported that um, if they ask uh, or uh, if they ask reviewers to make the their reports 
and identities open, um, then they're more likely to just decline to review. Although that's not um, that's not the case across all fields, um, and the the reported effects are relatively small. Um, I think that the the greater effect that people have seen um, has actually been um, uh, a greater quality of review if reviewers know that their review comments are going to be made open, and in particular if their um, uh, if their identities are going to be associated with that, the reviews tend to be longer um, and also tend to have things like fewer spelling mistakes, um, suggesting that perhaps the reviewers have have gone back and proofread their own comments, uh, which I think is a good um, a good sign for for peer review quality. Oh, um, Alex, I think you're muted, unfortunately. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got a, a about five minutes left in the stream, four or five minutes. So I'm going to throw over to um, Toby Hudson uh, from the University of Sydney. Uh, Toby's uh, um, created, developed a very exciting browser plugin uh, called Entity Explosion, which uh, uses Wikidata in some uh, pretty amazing ways and that anyone can access through their, their browser plugin platform. So. Uh, Thanks, Toby. I'll um, make you to the stream. Sorry. OK. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can see this screen. Um, yeah, it says StreamYard is sharing my screen. So I'm going to just present um, a browser extension that I developed recently. I'm sorry this is not quite in topic for the, um, the theme of today's program, but I think you'll find it useful. So, um, so let's see how we go. Uh, I was called in at the last minute to give this. Um, so uh, very briefly, the um, aim of this extension is that while reading a website, any website, anywhere on the web, um, you could discover links and information about the same topic on other sites. Uh, so the um, page there, Wikidata Entity Explosion, is the uh, resource hub, and you can find links to install your um, install the extension from there. Uh, I'm just going to, because I can't see anything about you, I just want to check that you've, can I, is there some way I can tell that you can see this? I assume it's all right. Um, OK, so, so I'll keep going. Um, uh, the um, the quick talk I'll give uh, will uh, show how I view Wikidata as a, a sort of Rosetta Stone of the internet. This is a, a well established concept, but um, but I agree with it, and uh, we'll we'll use it to explain how I've done uh, this today. So especially we'll focus on identifiers and languages, and then I'll show you some examples about how to use entity explosion. So you know the Rosetta, Rosetta Stone. Uh, it, uh, had lots of different languages on it, which enabled translations between those languages. And the idea here is the same. We're going to use um, a concept on one site and a concept on another site. As long as they're listed on the same Wikidata item, uh, we're going to make a map between those two concepts. Turns out Wikidata is full of external identifiers. This is um, a summary of all the property types we have. And although lots of the connecty ones, which connect items to other items, are really useful for making interesting queries, turns out that's not what we do on the, on the, in the majority. Mostly, we just list external identifiers. So our structure looks like this. We, we might have a uh, molecule and then links out to many, many um, uh, other databases about that same molecule. So we're not necessarily able to make um, complex cross-domain queries out of these things, but we can make use of these um, identifiers, and I'll show you how. There's another um, illustration by the linked Open Data Cloud um, trying to show how many databases there are out there that can be linked computationally by systems like Wikidata. So the, the crucial uh, info we have in a um, property, in a Wikidata property, are these um, formatter URLs here. So you can see um, the, the YouTube property, for example, um, says that if you put the um, identifier into the end of this string, this URL string, uh, you can go to that YouTube channel. There are actually a few different formats for parties who use the same formatter 
to give you content on their uh, third-party website. Uh, what this means is that um, if we go to one of those websites, perhaps we could recognize that we're in that one of those places that matches up with this property, and we could even extract the little bit uh, that is called dollar one here, um, which is the identifier, and it is supposed to have a format in this particular structure of some kind. Um, but if we can satisfy that, then we can then we can ask, well, okay, here is the identifier for this particular entity. Maybe it's a person's YouTube channel. Maybe we can then query Wikidata to find out whether Wikidata knows about that person, knows about their channel, and what else they can tell us about that uh, person. So I'll, I'll give you some examples of using uh, Entity Explosion. I really am not getting any feedback about whether you are all around. So I hope I hope everything's good. Um, let me show you some examples then. You know, here's a web browser, uh, and up the top you can see I have this little icon here, which is the Entity Explosion icon. Uh, let me just get rid of that. Um, so here is a, a typical Wikidata item, and you know that it has lots of labels in lots of languages. We're going to make use of that to do language translation, but it also has lots of information, and then down here, lots of identifiers. You see them all listed at the end. Uh, and so if I one, one use of uh, Entity Explosion is just to use it from Wikidata. If I call it from Wikidata, I get a summary of all of that information. So I get the English um, translation and its description, and all of that data is all just packed in down there. That's nothing special, because we, we could already see it over here. Uh, I guess it allows us to flick between languages if we want, but um, but that's not nothing special. What we can then do, though, is, is use the same um, query. We, we don't have to first do it on Wikidata, we could do it from anywhere. So we could do it from uh, Wikipedia, and you can see we'll get that same information about climate change. Oh, it's supposed to. Hang on. What's going on? Ah, OK. No. Sorry. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll move on to another example. Um, it was supposed to work also for, from Wikipedia. But um, here we go from a particular vocabulary, uh, and um, we're getting all that same information. We can click through to other vocabularies about uh, climate change or indeed any of these other uh, external identifiers which have all been looked up in Wikidata from there. So there are a whole range of uses. Um, if you're into um, citations or PubMed or something like that, you can go to a, a particular um, abstract page about that. So here's the page on PubMed about an article um, by a few of us, we click Entity the explosion. It looks up this string in Wikidata, finds out that, yes, we, we have a Wikidata item about that, gives you some basic details. Obviously, they're all on the page already, so there's nothing special here. But I guess what's interesting now is we can we can know that this DOI that it has worked, worked out, looked up from Wikidata, actually, there are a few different ways of resolving that DOI, and one of those we might choose, we might say, oh, well, let's look this same thing up, the same article up in Scolia. There was no link to Scolia from the PubMed. It would be nice if PubMed did that. But um, but no, we can we can just circumvent that, click through here, and find the Scolia page about that particular article. So we're really going na navigating across the web horizontally. We're taking the same item and now seeing more about that same item. And then, obviously, Scolia, you already know, um, does lots of things. You can do it for Twitter. If you find someone interesting on Twitter, here's Daniel Meachin. And um, he, his Twitter handle is already identified in Wikidata. And so you can find out all about him, go off to some of his more academic side of things if you approach from the Twitter kind of angle. And breaking news. One of the newest um, things that I've put in is a detection of a home page. So even if you're not um, in a database, even if you're just on a random website, this may work if the URL is listed on um, in Wikidata. So you, so you can get some information about the site that you're browsing, in this case, the Sydney Morning Herald. All right, I think I've gone probably way over time. So I'll, I'll stop now and see if there's questions or something. Um, stop. Screen share. Where do I look for questions? Thanks, Toby. That was great. We could see everything. So, uh, and uh, sorry, okay. I should have. Uh, if there, I hope there's no arachnophobes in the audience because uh, I should have given a trigger warning about your terrifying spider. Uh, 
Backdrop, don't. <laughs> I'll stand in front. So, sorry if there are any uh, people with have a fear of spiders. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think there's any questions. Um, comment from Siobhan. She loves this extension. Yes, thank you for your reviews, everyone. It, it really does help. It seems that reviews are the way that um, they sort extensions when they offer them to people who are just browsing for extensions. So do review if you haven't already. That'd be great. Um, yeah, and so sorry to everyone about the uh, the um, on the fly reordering of talks that we needed to do, but I'm hoping that people have got some interesting and useful information out of this, whether you are someone who is incredibly experienced in Wikidata or looking to learn because you haven't used it very much. Uh, and similarly, whether you have a lot of uh, knowledge in um, article metadata and librarianship or uh, whether that's outside your current area. Um, I'm hoping that this has provided some information for everyone. Um, what I'd quite like to do just for the next uh, short while is because we've had in some ways more questions than we've been able to answer, um, I'll just stick all of the remaining speakers who we still have in the broadcast studio on screen, um, just for a, a bit more of a freewheeling discussion on um, what the next steps are and any kind of uh, open questions that are added to the um, various broadcast streams. I think specifically YouTube is the main place where we're getting comments from, um, if there are any additional broad comments to everyone. Um, so I shall add back onto the stream um, Margaret and Amanda, if they're happy to come back on, um, as well as Liam, who has been the organizer for um, the conference as a whole. Why, hello. So, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, obviously, again for um, all of the uh, really interesting information that has been shared in this session. Um, and one of the things that I would like to ask to everyone, but um, I'm going to first direct to Liam, is if there was one big change, if there was one big change in um, uh, in sort of the wiki site portion of Wikidata, what would that one big change be? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm I for all the for all the uh, benefits of Wikidata's ability to concatenate and store reference information for external use. The thing that I feel is the largest gap or obvious problem is inside our own house. The way we handle references internally to Wikimedia is repetitive and inefficient. That we invented Wikimedia Commons more than 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, uh, as a way to store multimedia once and not have to upload it multiple times to put it onto different Wikipedias, let alone onto other wikis. Um, and I feel that we, if we started again from scratch now, we would do something similar with, with footnotes, with references. We consider, and the wiki site community considers references to be first class objects, but we treat them very poorly within our, within our software in that they're just uh, raw HTML, highly structured these days in, in complex templates, but we don't store one reference once and, and subscribe to it. We paste that same code in over and over again. I think that's uh, an artifact of the time when we started, not a choice that anyone would make now if they could, and it doesn't really represent best practices in any shape or form. Do others want to jump in? Thank you. That was really interesting, actually, and and a very good point that um, that yes, if the same reference is used on multiple Wikipedia pages, it has to be pasted in separately to all of those. And if an error is made in one of those, it's going to be um, very difficult to to spot and synchronize. Um, so what uh, same question open to to anyone else who has an opinion of sort of the the single largest change that would be useful within the, the Wikisite ecosystem? 
Well, I think Liam's comment is, is pretty spot on, actually. Um, it's very hard to see how um, to use Wikisite as a reference uh, within a Wikipedia article. I mean, the only place I've seen any use is the Scolia thing, and it, it's not entirely useful as it exists now. Um, but yes, he's quite right. We, we do put in the same reference every time we, we need to. We do not pull it down from Wikidata, um, which is a pity given that um, we're asking people to populate Wikidata. And, and if we do populate Wikidata, it would be fabulous to be actually able to use it easily within Wikipedia so that um, people were both conscious of it and, um, and as Liam says, we use it just once. Yeah, I um, it, uh, I tried using Wikidata to reference um, something in Wikipedia, and then I found that um, so it was a reference to a um, technical report information and a, a, paper, a report about technical about standard reports. Um, but then what you get is actually just a link to Wikidata, and you kind of lose some of the bibliographic information that you would see if I'd just done a standard reference. So it, it you know, rather than saying, oh, it, you know, you can go to the NISO, ANSI NISO website, oh, no, you go to Wikidata. Then you go to Wikidata, so then you, you still haven't got to the report. You're actually sort of just sending people to another bibliographic reference. And then they would hopefully may or may not get a link from Wikidata to the actual reference. So. Uh, possibly you could be sending people on a circuit around and, and you know, I'm sure we've all had the experience where you then try and search for something that's only referred to on Wikipedia and then you go back to Wikipedia, which is when you started from in the first place. So uh, we do run in a danger of kind of um, sending people off on, on you know, a wild goose chase and, and kind of, I mean, if we're going to use it, it needs to be embedded into Wikipedia with the the key information, you know, the organisation, the authors, the date, so you could get that information immediately as a template um, on Wikipedia. One of the things that I I do hope for is for institutions to take a bit more responsibility of uh, over getting making sure that their information is accurately on Wikidata because. Um, from the from the journal's point of view, I think that there's a lot of focus on making sure that you're correctly indexed in Scopus and PubMed and Web of Science and um, and similar indexing services. And I think that Wikidata should definitely be added to that list in the in the sense of if you're not on Wikidata and if your metadata isn't on Wikidata, something's gone horribly wrong. Um, and also making sure that they're able to pipe in a lot more of the metadata that otherwise doesn't get captured by other services. So one of the one of the problems with pulling in pulling in information from Crossref is that actually Crossref doesn't host all that much metadata. It's quite thin metadata that that Crossref actually holds associated with a DOI. And yet the um, the journals themselves actually hold a lot more structured information internally in their own databases um, about all of those articles. So I think that it would be very useful for uh, um, using journals as an example, but also you know publishing houses of books uh, and also the sorts of organizations that produce organization published literature slash gray literature. Um, that having those organizations take responsibility for it. I think a nice example has actually been um, Vanderbilt University. Um, and one of their staff members at Vanderbilt built Vanderbot, um, which is a bot that goes through um, Wikidata and updates all of the information about all of the academics that work at Vanderbilt University. Um, and I believe that the, uh, the next step is to also have um, uh, that university's um, information about the publications that they produce also um, curated into Wikidata as well. As it so happens, uh, Van der Bot and that project will be a discussion of a session on the Wednesday of this conference in the advancing librarianship uh, session. 
there's a lot of uh, cross, you know, uh, <laughs> cross connections happening here. Uh, you know, topics coming up in one, you know, very briefly that are, are being discussed in full later on. So, uh, uh, very interesting, all part of that, you know, wonderful connection knowledge graph. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions or um, comments? <laughs> um, if not, uh, we might uh, finish up. Thanks. Thanks so much to uh, all our speakers today. Um, thanks to uh, to uh, Daniel. Um, first off, uh, thanks to Margaret. Uh, thanks Amanda. Um, thanks Thomas, and uh, of course, thanks so much Toby for uh, stepping up. Uh, stepping up to the plate and, uh, and filling in uh, um, for us and, and showing us your, your amazing uh, browser uh, extension. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, as this is the last session for the day. Um, uh, well, you know, Monday, it's a Tuesday our time in Australia. Um, uh, thanks everyone who's uh, watching us uh, live. Hope you enjoyed it and you got some uh, um, something out of it. Um, and um, yeah, feel free to, uh, yeah, um, follow the rest of the streams in the next uh, two days. Uh, thanks, Liam, for organising it all, and um, I'll, uh, I'll end it there. Good, good thanks night, good everyone. morning, good afternoon, thanks. good evening, thanks, wherever you are. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. I need to go.